Well, greetings everyone. My name is Dr. Eric Dielsen, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Apparel, Events, and Hospitality Management in the College of Human Sciences at Iowa State University. With the growth of farmers markets and food retailers looking to buy local, entrepreneurs are now expanding their opportunities to turn their gardening, agricultural, cooking, as well as their food production interests into their own small businesses. To help these individuals, faculty from Iowa State University, as well as small-scale food operation experts, have created this series of TED Talk-inspired video presentations. These presentations, in the areas of experiential marketing, social media, event planning, building and cultivating relationships, storytelling, as well as other topics, are designed for entrepreneurs who are planning a small-scale food business or are in the early and or intermediate phase of a small-scale food operation. These video presentations are to be utilized in conjunction with a supplemental worksheets series. This project, titled Video Enriched Workshops for Small Food Operations in Underserved Communities in Iowa, is sponsored by Jefferson County Extension and Outreach and the College of Human Sciences Extension and Outreach at Iowa State University. For more information, please contact myself, uh, Dr. Eric D. Olson at 515-294-0699 or email O-L-S-O-N-E-D at I-A-S-T-A-T-E dot E-D-U. Thank you. So my name is Debbie and I um, have a company called Divinely Delectable. Actually, just shorten it to DD Gluten Free because no one can spell Divinely Delectable. So all of my logos now say DD Gluten Free. Well, I started baking when I was 10 years old. I probably started baking a long time before then with my mom. But at 10 years old, I um, was in Girl Scouts and you had to do a competition to earn a badge. So I made a vanilla cake, which is actually what I have here in front of me. However, my mother packed the bag and told me I didn't need to leave school early to get everything ready. And at the competition, I opened the bag, there's no vanilla, and I'm supposed to make a vanilla cake, and there was no plate. So I asked around, nobody had any vanilla, and he said, well, I just have to do the best I can. So I made a cake, and then I had no plate, so I washed one of the pans and turned it upside down and wrapped it with foil and, and frosted my cake on top of this upside down pan, and I got an honorable mention. Well. I kind of wanted a ribbon, but they said they kept tasting my cake, and tasting the other cake, tasting the cake down the table, and finally they said, can you come up here, the person who made this cake? And I walked forward and I knew what they were going to say. And they said, um, what kind of cake is this supposed to be? And I said, vanilla. And they tasted again and tasted mine and tasted again. I said, so why does it taste different than the others? And I said, because it has no vanilla. <laughs> so they, they asked me to go back to my place and eventually called me forward and said, we really want to give you something you know, for your cake. It textures great, tastes really good, but it's supposed to be a vanilla cake and there's no vanilla. So thanks to mom, I got started with substituting and learning how to make things work even when they weren't really working. So that's how I got started baking. And then in uh, 19... You know, in 2009, I became gluten-free. And before then, we had been missionaries, so I'd had to substitute a lot. And everything gluten-free in 2009 tasted like cardboard or granola. So I said, wow, something has to be better than this. So I started working on different things and um, came up with a flour combination that I uh, heard some tips from somebody else. And, and that's what got me started with um, DD gluten-free baking and flour. Now the baking was just a means to an end. I wanted to let everybody see what they could make and uh, say, hey, buy the flour. What I found is everyone wanted me to bake. No one really wanted to cook for themselves. So um, I ended up kind of doing more baking than I wanted. and uh, But I did more baking than I wanted and um, realized that this was not really the goal. And everyone I knew who was doing gluten-free baking, I, I asked, I said, well, 
you know, where, was your intention to do retail or was your intention to do wholesale? And they all said, well, we wanted to do wholesale, but the retail market has us so busy, we can't do the wholesale. So I really did a lot of rethinking. I had started off in my own home and only bought things as I could afford to buy them. I didn't want to do a loan. Um, my husband and I weren't in agreement on doing the baking in our house. So that created some issues and decided that I would just take a loan out and I would go and get myself a location. So I did that. But I found that people wanted me to be there during certain hours. And if I was staying there during those hours, I wasn't making enough money to pay somebody to be there. But then I wasn't able to market the flower. And so I was kind of in a catch-22. I couldn't really proceed with the flower if I stayed in a retail business. So we moved everything back home and um, I kept the locations that I had and tried to find a place outside of town because inside town there's too many restrictions. So back and forth we went. A year and a half later we finally found a location. So I moved in but it's still not ready because we have to remodel one of the rooms in the house to be a kitchen. So part of what happens when you have your own business is that it's really difficult to um, make jumps from one level to another. To be in a home business and to do the home baking was fine, um, but if I wanted to expand, then how do you get your product to the market? So then that would mean I would have to buy a truck. Well, I didn't want to buy a truck because I wanted to sell the flour. And so back and forth I went and decided that I'm just going to stop doing the baking. So in June, I closed the baking part and um, still just selling the flour and I'm writing cookbooks and I'm working on an idea to start um, teaching people doing some classes on gluten-free baking. And I've uh, been asking some of my customers, I have some interest in it, I'm trying to figure out how to get them on video, bought a video camera, wow. <laughs> so we'll see. I've tried doing a little bit of the selfie stuff that doesn't really work when you're trying to bake. So here we are. I have product to show and flour to sell. I also have some cookbooks too. We're not with me today. So stick around, more cookbooks to come. So when I first started, um, I was asking around and I heard that there was a lot of people who were going to the farmer's market. And the farmer's market here in Fairfield is really good. Also, they have an art walk, which is a once a month event. And there's all kinds of food vendors and art vendors. And so the, the farmer's market allows people in the um, local area to be able to figure out what you're selling and you can do taste testing. So I would have a whole table full of uh, food and say, hey, anybody want a sample? And I'd uh, draw people into the table and talk to them about the gluten-free and of course once they taste everything then they're all ooing and aahing and anyone who's gluten-free would come to my table and say, I can taste anything at the table. It was very exciting. So um, the product itself when, they're, when it's made into something like these cookies or brownies or cake, people are amazed. Wow, I can have gluten-free that tastes this good. So the farmer's markets are a really great opportunity to be able to get a food item out and have the public taste it. Um, they've actually helped me to make things a little bit better. I have a egg-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, it really has food in it, chocolate cake with chocolate chips and chocolate fudge frosting, and, and it's, it's dynamic and wonderful. And I don't even make another chocolate cake. It's so good. But it sounds like there's nothing in it except for there's a ton of flavor in it, so it's really good. That will be coming out in the cake cookbook. Um, there's other people who did the same thing, and so I started talking to the other um, vendors who were there, and when did you get started, and uh, is this the only place that you sell your product, and um, several of them told me that not only are they um, doing the same thing that I'm doing, they started out of their home, they're remodeling certain parts of their home, um, and then in the Whole Foods store, there's also a kind of an incubator site. 
And the Whole Foods store here in town is really, really wonderful about having local vendors and want to help promote business. So they will give you an opportunity to sell once a week um, in an open space that they have. Um, my product for um, about four or five years was in the freezer section. The flour is still available in the store. I no longer do the baking for the store. They have a restaurant in the back that they um, use as an incubator site and they allow somebody to work in there and have a business there and they pay them out of whatever they're earning and then they slowly back them off so that they trade it so that the people are then self-supporting and they're paying rent in essence by the by the end of their time there. There have been several businesses in there. There was a crate place in there. There's uh, currently a um, organic bagel store in there. Um, I can't remember all of the different um, restaurant owners that were in there. At uh, one time there was a cafe owner and a restaurant owner in there. So that uh, company has done a great service to the community um, helping small food um, venue business owners get started. Well, a lot of the barriers that you face as a small business owner are just money to begin with. How do you get started and have enough money to um, start working your business? Most of us start at home, um, start out of our garages or our kitchens, uh, basements, and the choice is about whether or not you want to take a loan or not take a loan. Um, you know, it's a really hard decision and then there's also issues of how do you, how do you communicate your product. Um, all of the designs on here I've had to learn to kind of be a graphic design artist. Um, made my own business cards up at first because I couldn't afford to buy a whole bunch. Um, there's, there's all kinds of uh, other little things that you don't think um, that are behind the scenes. I also do all the photography for my cookbooks and my Instagram account, Facebook. So you have to learn how to communicate your product as well as make the product. And sometimes the communication of the product is a whole learning process in itself. And that's just a lot of questions. I'm not sure if, if I did a lot of uh, questions as much as I did a lot of experimentation um, and then and then the other side of that is the, the whole loan process learning about whether or not you want to have a loan I currently have a loan I'm paying off for when I was in a location and now I would recommend to people that they don't do that um, I'd recommend that you don't take loans out unless you can see an immediate return for what you're getting um, you can get something back from it. For example, if you buy a machine that's going to help you process more and faster and you're going to make money right then. So to buy the machine before you're actually having a need for that size of the machine and you're not able to sell enough product to be able to at least pay off the, the um, payment and a little more from whatever you're going to make off of that, um, that would be my recommendation to people in the future. Um, loans kind of get you in a bind where you feel like you have a need for money and um, makes you focus less on the product than it, than it is on your worrying about how do I pay this off. Most of the people that I know in town right now that are um, trying to do something in a food venue also either are working another job or like the uh, barbecue place in town, Sweet and Saucy, which is really good, by the way. He says, you know, my wife works so I can have this hobby. And he is open six or seven days a week and fantastic food. But because it's so expensive to have a location, then you have to have some way to fund that. And usually it's a spouse. You have to have buy-in from your spouse. I think that's another thing that people come across. I did. My husband and I weren't really in agreement, and uh, so when you're battling at home and you're trying to battle to uh, push your product forward, I think that, that that can create too much tension, and you need to have some um, agreement and buy-in from your spouse. 
Well, first I started with everything I had at home. I started with three hundred dollars, and uh, in the bank, and I'm not even sure if I had a mixer at that point because mine had broken. So I bought a five dollar mixer from Walmart, which broke within six months, and bought a ten dollar mixer from Walmart that broke within ten months or six months, and bought a $15 mixer that broke within another six months. So then I went and bought a $90 mixer, and these were all hand mixers. Um, I think I bought it at Bed Bath & Beyond because they guarantee their products. And that one promptly broke, so I traded it in for an $80 model that was not so high tech, but looked like it was sturdy. And that one was doing really good. And then my husband said, you just need to stop doing this. You just need a KitchenAid. So he went online and found me a KitchenAid for Christmas. I would not have paid for it because I didn't have the money. But he went and bought me one. And so now that's all I use. So if you want something really good, buy a professional model KitchenAid. Because I did buy actually a stand-up that was another brand at Walmart. And it broke within three months. So I took it back and said, you know, this is not functioning properly. And yeah, don't buy one unless it's a professional model. Spend the extra money. There's sales online. Um, and get your family and friends to buy you stuff for Christmas that you need tools and whatnot. That's my recommendation. So, and then buy a little at a time. Always buy a little at a time. Keep use your profits to feed back into the business so that you're not developing debt and and you're constantly building um, what you have. This plate in front of me is uh, something I found for a dollar or two dollars. I said, wow, that would be great for pictures. So I bought it. I only have one. I don't have a whole set that looks like that, just in case you're wondering. <laughs>
cold or to keep it so it's not going to be um, so warm that it's it's uh, at risk of causing someone to get sick. You don't want someone to get sick. And, uh, and then just everything about your business has to be has to be something that you can feel like, okay, if I give this to people, are they going to be able to, number one, utilize it? Number two, um, am I doing it just to make money or am I doing it for my own reputation? If you don't do it for your own reputation, then you're probably at greater risk just because you're just doing it to make a, a dollar and you're not doing it to um, really produce something that's of quality. Because if you don't have something that's of quality, um, you're at risk of losing your whole business. People need to know that what they're getting from you is really good. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Fiore. I'm a faculty member here in Apparel, Events, and Hospitality Management at Iowa State University. And the topic of this talk is going to be experiential marketing. And what we're going to be looking at today are three things. The first is what is experiential marketing? The second is what is the impact of experiential marketing? And thirdly, what should experiential marketing look like? And then following this presentation, you'll hear from Dr. Eric Olson, who will talk about the basics of pulling together events, because you'll see that events are really important to experiential marketing. So let's start with what is experiential marketing? <clears throat> First, let's say, think about traditional marketing. You're trying to get a product to a consumer better, ch uh, cheaper, and faster. And you really see this consumer as being a logical information processor who's really concerned about price and quality. But when you think about experiential marketing, it's something different. You're really looking at something that goes beyond just looking for the Walmart customer who's looking for a good value for a fair price. What you're even seeing now is that Walmart is embracing what we're going to talk about, this idea of experiential marketing. So experiential marketing, a definition. It's any form of customer-focused marketing activity that creates a connection to customers. Okay, and so what do customers are looking for? You say, what's going to connect to them? Well, today's customers really want more than quality at a fair price. They want to feel personally connected to that brand. And by personal connection, what we're talking about, this idea of being connected to what the brand stands for. And they also want to feel this kinship or affiliation to that brand representative or owner of that company. And today's customers also want to have their preferences and their needs, needs heard by that brand. So you're really talking about building, building this idea of brand community through experiential marketing. And secondly, what you're looking at is this idea of they want a memorable experience. They want something that brings them pleasure, joy, surprise, and newness. Um, experiential marketing takes many physical forms. For instance, if you think about a lavish brand event, and you'll see a slide of Ben and Jerry's, where customers are actively engaged with that brand. They're sharing information with the brand representatives, and you get to sample products. So in this example of Ben and Jerry's, you can see that customers jump into a giant bowl of uh, little uh, balls, soft balls, like they're jumping into a bowl of ice cream. And that's really to launch their new brand of ice cream, looking at bringing in these uh, cereal flavors in terms of Fruit Loops or Cocoa Puffs swirled into ice cream. It can also take the form of a small, limited uh, time pop-up shop in an unexpected location, in a storefront or a mall. Um, or it can be something as simple as a small interactive child's uh, experience or an activity like this veggie race cars in a local uh, food festival in Minnesota where the kids can choose which one of the racers are theirs and they can see who wins. But in all these different examples, what you find is that customers have an engaging experience. They're interacting with the brand representatives and or the products. And there's a creatively designed space that leaves them with this real feeling of sense of pleasure or delight from the experience. And we'll look at more examples in the last segment of this talk. But next, for what I want to do is look at what's the impact of experiential marketing. What marketers say in recent industry reports are 
First, 77% of these marketers use experiential marketing as a vital part of, their mar of the brand's marketing strategies. 79% of brands said that they would execute more events and experiential programs in 2017 in comparison to the year before. And 65% of the brands say that their experiential marketing is directly related to sales. And what do customers say? Well, 70% of the customers um, who use these events say that they're going to become regular customers of that brand. And 74% of these event attendees have a more positive opinion of the brand after the experience. So what you can see is experiential marketing is really growing and pervasive. It's something that every owner of a company should think about using. And there's a positive impact from these experiences on a brand. And the last segment of this talk is really gonna look at what should experiential marketing look like. So there are six key factors for successful experiential marketing. First, we need to look at this idea of uh, making it a very multi-sensory experience. So that means you need to consider all the senses, what you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear, what you touch. All of these things need to be considered. You also need to think about making it emotional, emotionally arousing. It should be pleasurable, it should be exciting. And there should be a repetition of those brand elements, be it your brand colors, be it the message of your brand, but you need to repeat these things often uh, within this brand environment. And customers and brands need to learn something new and unexpected about each other. So you're there as a brand to learn what your customers want or what they like, and the customer's there to learn what's new and exciting about your particular brand. And customers really need to reinforce that physical connection. So they, they need some sort of physical interaction with the brand. And lastly, they need to be personally connected and relevant to the customer. So whatever you design, this experiential marketing event, needs to really fit into their lifestyles and values. So for instance, if you're a food company that's making healthy baby food, your event should really focusing, focus on things that are healthy kid events. So I want to give you an, a major brand example. So we're looking at wonderful brands, and they have a number of different products, um, such as Halo brands, uh, mandarins, they have wonderful pistachios, wonderful almonds, they have palm wonderful um, drink, and so they have many really healthy um, products that they sell within their brand. And Wink Designs in New Orleans has created a really wonderful experiential marketing event for Halo Brands that really hits on all these six key features. So as you look at the, these images from the event, you can see that it really engages their senses. It arouses their emotions with these bright colors, the dramatic event spaces, and you're greeted by an angel like you're being walked into a citrus fruit heaven. There's this repetition of the Halo Brand symbol throughout the event. There's also this reinforcing of that brand identity. If you've seen their commercials, it's the little kids talking to each other and one, two kids walk up to one kid who's eating a halo and says, hey, you, do you wanna go off and, and play around in the construction area? And he says no, and the next thing you do is you see two kids um, layered within concrete as, as the one smart kid was walking by eating his halo. So there's this real sense of fun to this brand that's part of their brand identity. And so as you walk into this event, there's this double entendre, I'm leaving my halo at the door. So there's always that sense of fun that they're trying to build into this experiential marketing event for them. And they get to physically interact with the brand at the party by including the Palm Wonderful juice in their drinks, which is personally relevant to the people that like this brand. It reinforces that desirable, healthy lifestyle, which leads that to a lot of word of mouth or even word of mouth from their customers. Or, they, or they're trying to make this share worthy. So something where they can share this um, through social media, electronically, or even person to person in word of mouth sharing. So there's six things, that's a lot to remember. So maybe we can condense this down to three things. So three features that you need to think about. Let's take these six features and bring it down to three. So when you're developing this experiential marketing event, what you need to think about and this comes from a researcher, I love this phrase, you need to dazzle their senses, touch their hearts, and stimulate their minds. So think about that, whatever decisions you're making in building this experience, 
dazzle their senses, touch their hearts, and stimulate their minds. Now, what are your goals? What are the goals of a successful experience or marketing event? Well, you want your brand to stand out. It's got to be different. It's got to be special. You want to stand out from your competitors. And you want to increase that awareness of the brand for the customer, but also you want to have more knowledge about what the customer wants as a brand. So it's a back and forth. It's a two-way interaction or communication. And you want this to lead to word of mouth either social media word of mouth or face-to-face -face word of mouth. You want your customers to do the marketing for you. And the end result, you want to develop repeat customers, loyal customers. That's going to lead to success. Now you're saying, well, what about sales? Don't I want to get some sales out of this? Many times when you're looking at experiential marketing, what you find the end goal of that particular experiential marketing event isn't in terms of sales. You're not thinking about how much money did I make off this. What you're thinking about is what's the marketability and the value of my brand after this particular event. So you're looking at it rather in terms of word of mouth and brand attitude. So when you think about it, how do we bring all these things to fruition? How do we take these three things and bring it to strategies within experiential marketing? Well, we can look at the four E's. And these are experiential marketing strategies that have been coined by uh, Pine and Gilmore. There are two uh, industry folks who have worked with large brands, but I think these apply to many brands, many different sizes. And what you find is that these four E's can help that customer feel connected to your brand and can create that memorable experience, which we said, this is what today's consumer wants. So let's look at the four E's. We're talking about entertainment, educational, aesthetic and escapist experience. And we're going to look at each one of these separately. So when we look at these, what we're talking about are four experiences divided upon two different continua, something very active to passive in terms of what the customer is really bringing to that event, and something that's either immersive or absorptive. So immersive is when you're bringing a customer into this richly designed environment. And absorptive is when they're bringing that experience into their mind. So the first one we're going to look at is this idea of entertainment. So here you're more passive. You're passively watching activities or performances created by others. Chips Chocolate Factory in uh, Kansas City. So when you're thinking about this, this is a indie brand, and what they do is they let the customer come in and watch the fudge being made. And so it's really sort of an interesting process. I don't know how fudge is made. I don't even like fudge, but I'd sit there and watch it for 15 minutes to see how fudge is made. It's really part of that entertainment experience that they offer that builds that connection to that brand. The second experience is really looking at education. So this educational experience where you're enhancing the skills or the knowledge in a very active way for that particular customer. So they're participating in the experience. And one of the examples here is uh, learning about whiskeys. So here you can go up and you can smell the different kinds of whiskeys that are offered by the whiskey experience in Scotland. So you're actively involved in pressing buttons, sniffing it, and trying to understand the differences between these, these different whiskeys. And there's even a whiskey um, distiller there who has this peat experience. So you give them 50 pounds, and you get to go out and collect the peat in the fields and bring it back so that they can use it in the creation of making scotch. And so that you're really actively involved in understanding what goes into that process of making scotch. The third experience is this idea of aesthetic experience. So this is where the customer enjoys a very enriched, unique, physical design. They sit back and they enjoy this passively. They appreciate just being in that setting. So when you think about it, here's a great example um, from Panera Breads. Think about standing out there in that cold environment in the winter waiting for that bus. Well, in this particular bus stop, they're selling you their, their new products at Panera's Bread coming out of the oven, but they also have radiant heat coming down and warming you. So you've got that wonderful physical experience, just standing there enjoying that idea of like being in an oven on a cold day. But it can be something as simple as really thinking about how to go about and redesign your booth. 
So think about all the vining that's going on here, the use of, of lighting, the use of gold, to really make this a more rich environment. This is also an example of aesthetic experience. And lastly, there is this idea of escapist experience. And here again, the customer is actively shaping that experience. They're contributing to what goes about to create that experience. And it offers that customer a way of taking on a new character, being in a new place or a new environment. And so think about this idea of this big chair. Here Disney is really trying to sell this idea of going back to those films of your childhood. And you think about that proportion of you um, as a child sitting in that big chair. So that it's bringing you back to that time in your life when you were a little kid. So you're getting to that escapist experience. You're, so you're actively involving sitting in that chair and remembering about being a kid. And lastly, this idea of this teddy bear. So think about um, Doc Mustafins, which is a, a show on TV on the Disney Channel. And it's about this six-year-old girl called Doc. And she goes about and she heals different toys in her backyard. And so in this particular uh, experiential marketing event, kids can come in and imitate being that, that doc in that film. So they be become that character. They can imitate what's going on, what they see on TV. So these are just four ways about going about and building that experiential marketing event to build that connection to that customer and make something that's really memorable. So you can look at some of these and you say, well, they're too big and they're too grand for what I can afford. Well, some of them think about the one with the vining. Could you go out and find local products in your backyard, flowers, vines, things like that, that you can use? Get some post, uh, paint them gold, weave them together. And so what you're doing is building that environment, something that's more interesting. Or maybe think about working together with businesses. So maybe three products, three local foods can get together and have a top chef cook-off using a combination of those local ingredients. Maybe a local jam maker, a local cheese maker, and a local free-range chicken producer can get together and hold this event. So this can really begin to promote all three of your products, make something memorable, have home cooks come in and cook off just like they would on the Top Chef show. That really can bring in people to watch. It could bring in uh, people can, to taste the different products that are created with the local goods. So this is a way that you can think about, hey, how can I work together with others to build these experiential marketing events? So hopefully we've given you a little bit of background on experiential marketing. If you want to learn more about it, just go home and, and Google experiential marketing and you're gonna see incredible experiences that have been created. When you looked at a lot of these experiences, you can see that a lot of them really focused on creating events. And so Dr. Olson is really going to talk about this idea of what are the nuts and bolts of event planning. And you also saw the importance of the idea of social media sharing, the importance of that word of mouth. Well, when you look at what um, Dr. Chong and Sai did, you're really looking at this idea of how do you bring social media to life. So in closing, I just want to ham hand off this presentation to Dr. Olson, and I want to do it in a creative way. So think about this particular image. So you're handing out samples at your product. Think about how even that simple process can be really made more experiential. So thank you for listening today. I hope you learned something about experiential marketing. And go out and, and see what the great things are out there in experiential marketing and try to bring them into your brand. Thank you. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric D. Olson, and I'm an assistant professor as well as the program director for our growing event management program here at Iowa State University. My colleague, Dr. Anne Marie Fiore, discussed a little on the aspects of experiential marketing and how marketers are utilizing the marketing strategies of the four E's. I want to extend that discussion and that conversation and talk a little bit about how event planners are actually utilizing events as part of their marketing strategy or their experiential marketing strategy to not only educate customers but also uh, to entertain customers with their food related uh, products. So here's my outline for the next couple of minutes. I, I first want to tell you a little bit about a definition of what an event actually is. And then from there I have three major suggestions I'd like to kind of share with you to provide you some tactics of your event planning. 
So a working definition of an event, uh, an event can be basically defined as a meeting or a gathering of two or more people for some sort of a common goal or, or some sort of a common purpose. But I also, I also want to um, add a little bit about that definition of, of an event because I think for a lot of our events, there's spatial considerations and there's also time considerations that actually need to um, occur. Think of a farmer's market that happens maybe every week on a, on a Saturday morning. That space is completely transformed for a period of time. The vendors will come in very early, will set up. Uh, the attendees will actually come in to purchase their, their products and services, and then everyone leaves at a certain period of time as well. So that spatial and that time consideration, I think, is very important. And the one other aspect of an event is this idea of heightened emotions. Event attendees, event attendees tend to be very excited when they go to events. We are, we're often in kind of this heightened emotional um, um, experience uh, when we go to our events. So with that working definition of an event, I want to tell you three specific areas that I'd like you to kind of think a little bit about in event planning. And those three areas are, number one, return on investment, uh, number two, event design, and number three, risk management. So let's go into that first area, that first theme on, on, on how important it is for event planners to really have a good a return on investment strategy. More and more in the industry, I'm actually seeing events taking a step back from the operation or from their event and thinking a little bit about the overall strategy of why an event actually exists and, and setting up specific objectives to conquer or to reach um, specific goals of an actual event. And I have a very nice framework that I like to spend a couple of minutes kind of going through. This is called the Levels of Objectives Framework. It's six levels of, of objectives that an event manager can actually set up. Level zero, statistics, scope, and volume. Level number one, reaction and satisfaction. Level number two, learning. Level number three, application. Level number four, business results or business impact. And level number five, which is the most sophisticated and the hardest to do, is actually um, creating that or finding out that return on investment. Level zero is all about statistics, scope, and volume. So an event manager, when thinking about the actual event, they need to talk or they need to set goals up as it relates to purely numbers. For example, the number of attendees that are expected to go to the actual event, the number of sponsors that the event planner was actually to obtain, um, the number of sales that actually occurred at that actual food related event. And lastly, perhaps the number of clicks on some sort of a social media uh, response would fall under level zero. Level one is reaction and satisfaction. And I think all of us have been to some sort of a restaurant or, or a coffee shop where we have been asked to rate the level of service on, on a scale of one through seven. So reaction and satisfaction tends to be all about setting those objectives as it relates to the service quality of that actual event. It could be on the cleanliness of the actual event, the accessibility of the actual event, the food, the, the beverage, the entertainment, the venue of that actual special event. Level two is all about learning, and I think this is perfect for our food-related events. Often when attendees go to events, they learn new information. They gather information about new products or, or new services, and they take that information back with them. So the level two category, setting those objectives as it relates to the learning aspect. Level three then is all about the application aspect. So, so I learned information, I got new data, got new information about a product. I am now going to do something about that information. I'm going to apply it in my personal or my professional life. So when event managers set up objectives in the application category, it's all about how we're going to, to, to create some sort of a new sale. So an event attendee learned a new, about a new product at that actual, I'll say, farmer's market. They took that information, they applied it to their daily life, and then they, they purchased that actual product. Level five is impact. So we set up our objectives pertaining to the impact of that actual event. And love, level six is that return on investment. And that return on an investment is a comparison. It's a comparison ratio. We are comparing the benefits of that actual event to the true costs of that actual event. And that concludes my little discussion about the levels of objectives. So 
In addition to the first theme I wanted to recognize about setting those clear objectives uh, utilizing the levels of objective framework, I want to talk a little bit about some trends that are occurring in event design. The good news is that Americans are going to more and more events every single year. The other side of that, though, is there are actually more and more events that are competing for, for our time. Additionally, we do know that events are actually shorter in nature. So on one hand, we're going to more events, but the events that we're going to, we're going to uh, a shorter in nature. Additionally, without a doubt, events are becoming much more interactive. And food-related events are already set up for success for, to, to recognize uh, that specific trend. Um, demonstrations, the use of samples, Event attendees, when they go to food-related events, they want to know not only about the product or the service, they also want to know about how that product and service was created, where it was created. They want that interaction. They want, they want to know the product developer, the entrepreneur, um, um, the, the insight, the behind-the-scenes um, information about that actual product. Event goers are more sophisticated than ever before. I think several years ago when event goers would actually go to a specific food related event, they would go to the event, they would walk around, they would sample maybe a product. Nowadays, event goers already have that information um, um, about front and they already know where they want to go. So in a way, they, they already have information about your product, they've already Googled your, your, uh, your, your company. So when they get to the actual event, the event goers know specifically in that path uh, of where they want to go and who they actually want to visit. Um, events are becoming much more inclusive and this is a very good thing. And I think the in event industry in a way actually leads um, 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 society in terms of making sure that events are very inclusive. Ensuring access to events. Everyone from someone who has a disability, which one in six Americans actually uh, uh, currently does, but I think inclusiveness could also be, uh, I'm thinking a little bit about some of the non-disability awareness elements such as a family who utilizes a stroller to go through maybe a food festival. Or it could be um, a, a baby boomer who is bringing their adult or their, their, their adult parent with them, who's maybe a little more elderly and, and needs some different tools uh, to navigate a, an actual event. And then my last trend that's occurring in the event industry is this idea of an un-event. And I, first, I know for some of us that may be a term that we never heard of before. But there's an initiative for a lot of our events to be kind of an un-event. So traditionally, a lot of events were very programmed, especially with, with a food events. There's a set agenda, there are speakers, there are modules, there's, there's education, there's entertainment that was actually occurring. In an un-event, people would actually go to a specific event, and then the programming actually exists in more of an ad hoc basis. So often various um, influence will actually set the schedule, that they will set the, the, the meetings or, or the group or the interaction components to actually occur at that actual event. So I've talked a little bit about kind of this, this element of setting up objectives for uh, creating events that um, re, uh, create a, a strong return on investment. I've talked a little bit about the um, event design. The third theme I want you to recognize in kind of the event planning is that of risk management and providing a safe and secure experience um, for all event attendees. Without a doubt, industry resp is responding to several different events that have occurred in kind of the negative realm in the last couple of years. So I have kind of a five-step process I want you to think a little bit about in setting up kind of a risk management plan for an actual event. Step number one is to take a step back and think a little bit about the overall risk in the context of that actual event. These are the larger societal forces at hand. It could be an economic factor, it could be a social, a political, a legal, a cultural factor at hand. That's that mac macro environment in which an event actually operates in. The second step in, in creating a risk management uh, process is to think a little bit about the unique risk specifically for that actual event. We think a little bit about the event scope, the event design, the event marketing. So for my farmer's market example, an element or, or of a risk uh, would be weather, since the event um, could be occurring outdoors. The third step is analysis stage. And in this risk management step, the, the event manager needs to add some sort of a quantifiable elements to all the different risks that could actually occur. So this is a brainstorming stage. A risk can be defined as anything that would actually get in the way of an event manager achieving those objectives that were previously set uh, for that actual event. And I think another way we can think of risk is to categorize them into weather-related, 
um, such as our tornado, um, human-made, such as a terrorist attack, or even an increasing genre of a risk, technological risk. Everything from loss of power to the loss of a personal laptop. So in the analysis stage, the vet manager needs to kind of add some quantifiable, some quantifiable elements such as the likeliness of that risk to actually occur. And after the event manager um, analyzes the different risks, the risk manager needs to think a little bit about some con control uh, processes. So control essentially means what am I actually going to do about that risk? Am I going to take on that risk? Am I going to cancel that risk? Am I going to modify my operation? So maybe for an outdoor event, instead of using glass bottles, I'm going to use plastic cups. Um, and another control factor could be I, uh, is that I could actually transfer that risk to maybe a third party vendor. And then the last stage in the risk management uh, process is the evaluation stage. And that's typically done after the actual event. Where I take a look at the event, I, I get feedback from a wide variety of different stakeholders. I, I recall any incidences that actually occur at that actual event. And, and I, I make some modifications for my overall risk management plan for the next event. So folks, I uh, want to uh, tell you a little bit about the event planning, planning process. Um, to conclude, I gave you a, little, a brief definition of what an event actually is. And I kind of gave you some strategies and some tactics for some three areas in kind of the event management world that I'm starting uh, to see um, event managers really pay attention to in the, in the industry. The first of which is setting those objectives to create a, that strong return on an investment. The event, event design aspects as well, making our events more interactive shorter in nature as well as more accessible to a wide variety of audiences. And then that third stage is to create that comprehensive risk management program for that actual event. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Hedquist. Uh, I'm the owner of Hedquist Productions and I'm a marketer and I also have, so I have one foot in the marketing business, but I also have a foot in the agriculture business. I own a 145-acre farm just north of Fairfield, Iowa, and so I've got a little bit of knowledge in both those areas, and maybe there's something I can do to pass on some information to help you. My goal is to help you market your products to customers, but before that you have to market it to the people who will sell those products, the stores, the retailers. So there are lots of ways that you can market products. And when I say market, it's involved in selling, advertising, direct contact. There are lots of ways to talk to people about carrying what you manufacture, grow, process. And I found that the best way to do that is through stories. And you might say, what do you mean stories? And what I mean is, I call it story-based marketing. We have grown up with stories. We are attracted to stories. We love stories. Now, you've got a lot of facts about what you do. Here's the benefits, and here's the process we go through. And, and they're kind of dry. And you're used to telling things in terms of facts. But if you take those facts and make them into stories, they become sticky. I like to say that stories make the facts sticky. And there's a real advantage to having those stories sticky. For instance, um, stories have power, and you basically know how to tell stories already. What I do is I work with individuals and companies and organizations, helping them tell better stories. That's all. So I take the stories that you already have, and I show you how to tell them in a better way. And the stories can be about you. For instance, what got you to do what you're doing? Was it uh, a desire to uh, create something? It might have been a recipe that your grandparents or parents had and you decided to do it and, and your family liked it. And then you sold some or you know, gave some to your neighbors and they said, this is really good. You could sell this. And maybe you sold some at the farmer's market. And then the reaction was good and suddenly, by accident, you're in the processing business. You're in the food processing or some other processing business, and you're, you're in it by accident. So there's a story that you can tell of how you got started. The story might be about your journey, how you got to where you're doing. And it, that journey might have been that you looked at the market and you said, you know, there's a need for such and such, 
or there's a national trend for this kind of food or this kind of product, and you decided that you had a better way of doing that, and you created it that way. So then again, there was a market-based story that you can tell, and there's, there's another kind of story. Um, it could be about your process. You may have something unique in the way you grow, process, ferment, freeze, dehydrate, bake, whatever it is that you do <laughs> to create products for the market. May be unique, and if that's unique, that's a great story because I'll, I'll show you why stories are good. And then finally, your product. What's good about it? Is it especially helpful? Healthful? It, does it uh, serve people who have food allergies? Is it um, uh, kind of a breakthrough product? Is it tastier? Is it more fun? Is it more interesting? What is it about your product? Every one of those aspects, there's a story. And so, what do you do with those stories? Well, who are you going to be talking to? You are going to be talking to individual owners, for instance, of retailers. And if you can tell a good story to that retailer, then they feel, okay, I could put a few of these on the shelf and hopefully they'll sell and they'll make money. So I would say the overall approach to all the different audiences that you talk to is how can I make this easy for them? How can I make it simple for them? And what are their fears? Well it's not going to sell. They're not going to make money with it. You won't service them. You won't take back products that are expired or that don't work. You won't guarantee your product. There's, you're, you're brand new to a lot of these people who are going to be buying your product and selling it. So you need to make it easy for them. You need to make it a no-brainer. How can you do that? You can do that with stories. Because if you give them a story to tell, for instance, let's talk about that individual retailer. If you convince him or her to put your product on the shelf and you tell a good story, that gives them a story that they can tell their customers. So the customer goes and they see your product on the shelf and it's a cookie, let's say, a certain kind of cookie, and they ask the owner of the store about that cookie, he can then recall the interesting story that you told you know. The macadamia nuts that they brought here are from a certain area of Hawaii. Or, you know, the walnuts that are in here were grown on a farm in Grinnell, Iowa. And suddenly, the customer has a better connection to what you've put on the shelf. You've convinced that retailer to put on a shelf. So, you've benefited the retailer, you've benefited the customer, and obviously you've benefited yourself. What's the next level? You could be talking to... Um, uh, Managers uh, who are managers of one store of a chain of stores, and so what they have to do is they have to sell the idea that you you they have to sell your story to their management. So again, if you tell a good story, that gives them a chance to talk to a board of directors or owners or whoever to again uh, carry the product. Say you know I talked to this uh, this farmer who's now processing this particular kind of uh, soft drink, and I think it would be good for our store. And again, the story gets passed from you to the manager to the owners. It could be a distributor you're talking to. If you've got a few retailers um, that are, you know, that are successful with what you're doing, um, then the distributor may want to carry it. So again, if the distributor gets that story that you've told, or those stories that you've told, then they can sell it to the owner, the manager, and eventually to the customer. Now what happens with all of this is the stories become as powerful as the product. Because what you want to do is you want to develop a following, you want to develop, uh, hopefully, a list that you can market to, and that list can be people that you've met uh, directly, people that you, you may have a CSA, you may have a, a uh, you may be selling directly to people at a farmer's market. Collect the addresses, or at least the email addresses of everybody, and then give them a bonus for doing that. Say, I will send you a 10% on the, the product, or 20%, or I'll send you a free product, or whatever it is, for getting their email address. And let them know that I'm not going to, you know, try to sell you everything all the time. And then, as you collect these names, which are the names of customers, managers, all the people we talked about, store owners, you can send out information about your product stories again. And the stories about the product 
can be how to use it, they can be recipes, uh, they can be new things that you found out, new successes that you've gotten. And every once in a while, put an offer in there to, again, the managers, the store owners, or the customers, and say, hey, you know, we've sent you three or four uh, of these stories or these recipes, and then here's a bonus uh, for, you know, for reading our stuff. And so every once in a while, you send them an offer. You know, maybe three bits of three bits of information, and then an offer. Another three bits of information and an offer. And you can do those weekly. You can do them monthly. You can do them quarterly. Whatever works for you. So that's another way to use stories. Now, where do you get stories? The stories can be from your own life. All the things that we talked about. You know, you, the process, the what you went through to create what you've done. It can be, and this is especially powerful, testimonials. When you have a, and, and these testimonials can be from the, the people that you've sold to directly. They can be your relatives. They can be your neighbors. They can be the people who uh, bought from your CSA. They can be people you met at the farmer's market. Get them to tell stories. Those stories are testimonials. Those testimonials can be used to help sell the store owner, etc., all the people that we mentioned. And the stories can be video. That would be ideal. If you're selling at a farmer's market, you bring a video camera. You bring your cell phone and you say, hey, do you like what you're taking? Yeah, this is really good. Can I get a video of you? And get a video of them. Um, it could be audio uh, of them with a photograph. It could be a photograph and print out what they say. Now, how do you get testimonials? One of the best ways is as soon as somebody is purchased, get a testimonial from them right away because then they're in the euphoric, I've just tasted this, this is pretty darn good, I like it, I think I would buy it, I think I would make a gift of it, I think I would sell it to my family, etc. Um, the One of the best ways that I found to get testimonials is if you're talking to, again, customer, owner, store owner on the phone, and you ask them, you know, how is it going? And, and it may be successful, hopefully it is. Uh, and they talk a little bit about that. You can ask them some questions. Is it selling? Is it profitable for you? Would you like to reorder it? We're going to add some other uh, aspects to this product line. Would you be interested? Get all that information. At the end of the conversation, say, hey, that was really good. Can I use some of those comments in our marketing? And usually they'd say yes. And what you do then is take those, transcribe them, clean them up a little, make it into a story again. And that's one of the things I do when I work with companies is show them how to take those testimonials, make them into stories. Send it to the person you just talked to and say, hey, if, this, if you approve this, I'll use it. If you want to make any changes, please do so. A lot of times when we're trying to get testimonials, what we do is we call and say, hey, can I get a testimonial from you? And the person says, yes, but they never do it. They never get to it. Or they send you something that's kind of lame. The best way is just to get them talking, get a conversation going, transcribe that conversation, then send it to them and say, would you approve this? 99% of the time they will approve it, and now you've got testimonials. What you want to do is, I, I talked about making it easy for the person to buy from you. If they have the confidence that somebody another customer has bought it, another store owner has purchased from you, another distributor has purchased from you, suddenly they feel they're not alone. They feel, okay, somebody else does it and it was successful. They feel good. So again, you've given them confidence with story. Um, the best stories you can tell are about your audience. So the testimonial story is kind of cool in that that's a story that's being told by the person who has purchased tasted, served to their family your product, or the store owner who has put it on their shelves and found that there was some success, or the distributor who said, you know, I was able to sell four or five retailers with this and they're all doing well. Again, those are stories about the audience that you're talking to. Those are the most powerful kinds of stories. And how can you use the stories? You can use the stories when you make an in-person sales call. Um, because then it becomes less of a sales call and more of a conversation, more of an interactive relationship with whoever you're selling to. It can be used in blogs. It can be used in podcasts. It can be used in videos that you can put on YouTube. It can be, you can make a story in 120 characters 
so they can be passed on as a tweet. Um, you can use it in radio and TV commercials. You can use it in ads. Um, there's just so many ways to use stories that this is one of the best ways to help market your goods to the rest of the people. So if I can be of any assistance, and I work with all kinds of advertisers and companies and organizations and individuals throughout the country, helping them market what they're doing um, to their audience, um, just let me know. Uh, I think the contact information is there uh, available for you. Um, keep in mind, make it easy and comfortable for whoever you're selling to. Um, take away any risk. You know, you guarantee that if it doesn't sell, you'll take it back. You guarantee if there's any problem with any of the product, you'll take it back. Um, let them feel confident that they can go with you, kind of an unknown, uh, and help them fall in love with you and your product by telling them really good stories. Did you know that almost all American adults are digitally connected? According to a survey by the Pew Research Center, as of the end of 2016, 69% adults in the U.S. use at least one social media platform to connect with friends, family, like-minded people, and brands. Social media is such an inseparable part of consumers' life that 71% of consumers who have had a good social media service experience with a brand are more likely to recommend the brand to others. Many brands are using social media as a marketing tool to increase brand engagement and win new customers. So what exactly is social media marketing? Social media marketing, by definition, is the process of using these platforms to reach your target audience with relevant information and promotion, to interact, to build trust, and to make sales. A family-owned restaurant sharing a video of Grandma Jan uh, making her best-selling dish on their social media page is social media marketing in action. A farmer sharing a picture of the just bloom apple trees is social media marketing in action. These businesses are reaching out to the members of these social media platforms to capture their attention and expose them to their messages, products, and services. It seems intuitive for business owners to be on social media platforms. And it seems every business owner feels that they need to be on social media, otherwise they are behind the competition. But is social media the answer for everything? How can you use social media to get the most out of it? Here are some pros and cons of social media marketing for small business owners. First, social media marketing has low cost. Most social media platforms cost you nothing to create accounts and has no limits on how often and how much you use them. Authenticity. Social media allows you to tell your own story and to maintain the authenticity of your own social media presence. It is not controlled by anyone else. Interactivity. Social media allows you to interact with your loyal customers and your potential customers equally. It allows two-way dialogues between businesses and customers. Instead of pushing out one-way broadcasts, you can turn to social media to learn about your customers through meaningful interactions. Social media can reach a big audience without geographic limitations, while with the little cost, it can also target specific audiences, such as people who live in your city, people in a certain age range, etc. With these plus sides of social media marketing, businesses may turn customers into brand ambassadors and build the sense of community among those who follow them on social media platforms. However, social media marketing comes with some shortcomings. If you want to have a constant and vivid social media presence, it can be time consuming to manage your accounts, creating contents, and responding to your audiences. 
you do not have control over what people say on your social media platforms. So there is a possibility to see negative comments on your business from your audience. Having a pre-planned damage control strategy ahead of time can help lessen the harm done by the negative comments. But however, it can also add to the time-consuming aspect of social media marketing as well. If you have limited time, which social media platform is right for your business? How do you prioritize your usage of social media for marketing? The short answer is, it depends. Remember, no matter what products you sell, you have to start by examining your target audience. Ask yourself these questions. Who are they? What social media platforms do they prefer? How much do they spend on social media? What mindset are they in when they are spending time on those social media platforms? According to a survey from the Pew Research, Facebook still dominates other social media platforms in terms of the numbers of users in the US. Facebook is also the most daily checked social media platform in the US, followed by Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Judging by just how many people you can reach, Facebook can be the most fundamental social media platform to start with. Comparing with other popular social media platforms for small businesses, Facebook is especially good if your target market is 55 years old or older, and if your target market is small niche market. It allows most types of content, including images, texts, um, videos, external links, and it is very useful if you have important updates about your business. It allows you to set up business pages and track the effectiveness of each message that you post. With a little more cost, you have an option to pay to promote your messages. Twitter used to have the second largest number of users until Pinterest and Instagram became dominant social media platforms in around 2015. But about 70% of small business followers on Twitter retweet contents by the brands that they follow. It is used by more millennials and teenagers, and it allows shorter contents, resulting expectations from your audience of more frequent updates and more real-time report type of updates. Users can tweet text of about 280 characters long. They could tweet pictures, videos, and short polls. Businesses can set up business accounts and track the reach of their messages. Also, with a little extra cost, you can promote your tweets. Many businesses also use Twitter as a tool for customer services. Instagram is relatively newer comparing to other social media platforms. It is useful when your audience is mostly millennials and women. About 68% of Instagram users engage with brands and businesses on Instagram regularly. The contents shared are primarily images and videos about 3 to 60 seconds long. People share most about foods, arts, travels, and fashion. Finally, Pinterest is a visual-oriented social media platform and it allows users to save and display pictures and short videos by pinning them on their digital bulletin boards. Consumers often save and pin the images the brands shared. Consumers usually do not expect frequent updates on Pinterest from the brands. Therefore, it requires lower maintenance. The users on Pinterest are mostly women aged between 18 to 29 years old who are most interested in DIY, fashion, beauty, and food. I hope you are more familiar with the different types of social media platforms and what they are best used for. 
Now I'm turning the floor to Ken, who will talk about strategies of using social media platforms. As you just heard from Dr. Chong in the video earlier, choosing the right social media platform for your business is critically important to carve your social media strategy. As a startup or small business owner, you know there is a lot to accomplish with very limited resources. Traditional marketing can be a drain on your funds. Social media marketing, on the other hand, is pretty low cost and give you a direct line to current and prospective customers. It's a trade-off though. What you save in dollars, you will invest in time. So you have to be smart and efficient with the resources you have to achieve the results you need. So how can you start? Just thinking that you need to create a social media marketing strategy, not an easy task, right? Crafting an effective social media strategy to help you achieve your goals can be a real challenge. If you haven't used social media to market your product or services, you're going to love how easy it is to get started. So next, I'm going, I will show you six steps you can take to make social media marketing work for you. Step one, understand and create measurable goals. The first step to any strategy is to understand what you want out of your effort. You can set clear objectives based on your goals and focus on the SMART, S-M-A-R-T strategy for your goal setting to ensure your objectives are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. It's the best to set goals you know are attainable. Asking for one million new Instagram followers in 2018 is definitely unrealistic. So with achievable goals, you are more likely to stick with the, to your original plan and continue to take on the new hurdle as you compete with others. So here are some few simple ideas for social media goals you could focus on. First, increase brand awareness. Yeah, focus on meaningful content and strong brand personality through your social platforms. Second, or drive traffic to your website. If you already have your own blog or website, business usually can rely on the social media marketing effort to drive people to your website or blogs or even your in-store sales. Is your brand promoting enough on social to reward those who comes to you? Third, you can build a community around your business. As a goal, does your brand promote user-generated content? Or do your followers react possibly without any in initiation? So getting to this point takes time and efforts with creating a positive brand persona on social. Step two, research your social media target market. Now you know where you're going, but you still don't know how to get there. A successful social media marketing strategy is all about targeting the right people and with the right messages. Social media is all about connecting with your audience in two-way communication. To do that, you have to in intimately understand your current and poor potential customers. For example, you cannot include everyone in your target market. It is simply because um, one specific message won't vibrate effectively with different demographic group. Every group also have unique preference and travel through the buying process at varied times and speed. Let's think in this way. Do teenagers and grandparents go to the same type of restaurants? Or do they in interpret the needs for product in the same way? Do they decide to buy products for the same reasons? Nope, nope, nope. So separate creative piece need to be developed to appeal to your audience members in appropriate ways. So the best way is to start by defining your audience personas. Distinguished individual ideal audience character profiles by 
their age, gender, interest, professions, and so on. Don't just say it out loud, but write it down. Detail and find the image that represents your target audience. So defining audience persona will help you not only with crystallizing your message post, but also in determining which social media platforms to use. All social media platforms are not, just, are not created equally. Each one has their different primary audience and focus. It is very important to understand the differences so you expand your efforts on the right platforms. Stick only to these platforms as trying to work with too many will take resources away from the platform and they are likely to bring you the results. Step three, learn about your competitors in the industry. It is great to look at your competitors in your region area first. They can tell you a lot about what works or what doesn't work. After all, they are targeting the same customer you are. If you ignore your competition, you are giving up a wonderful chance to learn from their successes and mistakes. So to research your competitor, start by picking, well, about three to four of their top ones and find out which social media platform they are active on and study their content. For example, is it funny or serious? What kind of cultural references do they use? Or do they talk about their product primarily or do they focus on other things? Another example, if you sell a farm produce, do your competitor talk about how they grow their farm produce or do they post amazing food processing video that just happened to include their produce? Then see how well each competitor is doing. Like how much engagement, comments, do they do a lot of comments, shares, and how many likes do they have? They get on their Facebook updates. That will, this will let you determine which strategy works and which is not working. There's nothing wrong with mimic the pro, mimic some of your competitors' successful messaging ideas, but also try to be creative on your own original messages. That set you apart, and this will help you to create a unique brand voice. Don't be afraid, get creative, as your social media presence should be exciting, not boring. Step four. Let's get social and start small. A lot of time we have a big dream. But you have defined your target audience. You know where to reach them. And you are optimized your other marketing touch points. It's time to get social. But there's one of the most important pieces to advise to keep in mind. Yeah, we have big dream. But, so listen up, start small. You're not going to catch everyone in the world. So social media takes time and energy, which are precious re resources. Set yourself up for success by starting with a manageable load. I would suggest you choose one or two platforms to start with. The best way to guarantee consistency is to incorporate social media into your daily routine, part of your life. Block out times on your calendar, turn off a distraction and dedicate time to managing your social media accounts. Do this one or two different time slots every day. In the first, two, first month or two, expect to spend a minute of 15 to 30, a minimum of 15 to 30 minutes of the day on social media activities. You can increase the time as you see feet. Step five, remain on track with an editorial calendar. Although interactions with your audience should be spontaneous, you need to plan the publishing of your content down to find details to get most out of your social media strategy. 
draw up a plan for the coming month that describes when you will post to each channel, what type of contents you will post, and how this will help you to meet your main goal. If you're not sure how to divide your content into different themes, Who Sweet recommends the following. One third of your content should promote your business, and one third should share ideas from your industry. And last one third, you should focus on personal interaction that develop your brand image. Furthermore, you see the example from Who Sweet on the content marketing calendar on the slides. The time you post to the platform is very important. For instance, there are more users on Facebook after working hour on the weekend. And Twitter, in contrast, experienced the highest number of clicks between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. every day, from Monday to Thursday. So that's all the routine you should look for, you should research for, you should seeing how your target audience they are on the social media platform. And there are some tools you can use. You will need a social media management tool to organize and manage your daily social media activities. So WhoSuite is a social media dashboard that offers monitoring, scheduling, and analytics services. And another one I would suggest is Sprout Social. It's another cost-effective tool that helps you to find and schedule content and track social media performance. Last, the step six, build your content plan. Finally, you will need to develop a strong content plan that will deliver emerging material. The content need to align with your overall messaging and be appropriate for the platform you are using. Don't just stick to one type of media. A mix of videos, guides, infographics, and other styles will engage your potential customer more effectively. Also, don't think of the content as something you post once. You will need have ongoing presence on social media. And that includes delivering fresh content on a regular basis. So quick reminder here, like every other aspect of your content marketing strategy, your social media strategy needs to be constantly changing. Look through your metrics and analytics every week to ensure you, rem ensure you remain on track and keep refining your idea to meet your goals. So here is the end of the social media marketing video. I hope you have got some basic knowledge what social media marketing is about and draft your own social media marketing strategy from now on. So are you ready to connect with a wider audience? Let's get social. We do local food systems development and implementation within the community, primarily Jefferson County, Iowa right now. Um, we also work a bit in Wapolo County. Uh, both areas received a large USDA grant, and we are um, collaborating a bit with that. Um, I direct the Southeast Iowa Food Hub, which has been in operation for three years now, uh, for two years of which we actually aggregated and distributed food in the area. As, um, as a nonprofit uh, under the Sustainable Living Coalition, which our project, the, the Food Hub, is under, uh, we plan to do, and I have been doing all along, a lot of educational work as well in the area of local food systems. And um, the word, the term local food shed is um, kind of the umbrella, if you will, for local food systems. It is kind of the, the, the anchors in the community, the grocery stores as a starter, which we're all familiar with. But in a working local food system under a food shed, we're including local foods, and that's where that term really came from, which during the growing season in any area, um, you bring those foods in and market them to the community, and they're almost a replacement, if you will, for some of the foods that might be coming during the other season from California or Mexico or um, South America in the warmer climates when we have winter here. 
So developing that whole system to for the purpose of creating food security in our region of the state, and uh, the food hubs actually, of which there are about six, seven of us that were part of this grant, uh, work and collaborate together to create the system throughout Iowa. So even though we're primarily focused on our region, as the other hubs are, we also work together. Well, during the growing season, obviously, they can acquire foods through the farmer's market, direct to the farmers. They can even go direct to a farm that doesn't maybe function within uh, a farmer's market. Um, and they can come to us because we, we do aggregate, we can acquire things from farmers, and we have those long-standing relationships with farmers. So that's a great support system for um, small food entrepreneurs. Um, also, during the off-season, which wouldn't necessarily go through our organization, they can go to the two local main grocery stores, which would be hy -Vee, um, which are great supporters of local food, and our local uh, Everybody's Whole Foods natural grocery store, also great supporters of local food. Uh, and they can buy foods by the case at a discount for their operations, so they wouldn't necessarily have to immediately um, <clears throat> align with a very large distributor, national food distributor, um, but they could go and buy as they need, which is really important for restaurants in particular. You know? um, and it's important for probably someone who's doing a value-added product, someone who's making pickles or sauerkraut or kimchi. These, these items are all very popular now, and they're, they're easy products to make. Um, and they, they should be buying by the case, and I'm sure they are. So these are kind of quick, easy ways for them to acquire um, they could grab an extra case if they're short on something from Hy-Vee or everybody's, maybe even after they've placed an order. Maybe they placed an order through a large distribution network, but not all of it was fulfilled at the time that they needed to, to make their product. So um, these are some of the ways. That well, I think there's a, a number of entities that um, small businesses can consult with, like obviously the Chamber of Commerce that every community has. Um, Fairfield Economic Development Association is an organization that we have, and I think most communities do have an economic development group in their community. Uh, we have worked with them in the past. They often do um, small business competitions where you come in and you can present uh, whatever it is that you're wanting to do or get launched, or maybe you're, I think you, we did a couple of them here and you had to be, um, you couldn't have been in business for more than two years, something like that, and then you could compete. And it was a small, relatively small award, uh, but then I think some local businessmen came in and helped build the amount of that and helped build it up. So that was very, very helpful. Um, and, and it sort of presents uh, a lot of the business leaders in the community come and uh, observe this and are on the panel to decide who would be you know, the winner of this uh, award. So it kind of gets their business out there right away, you know, if, if they're just starting. So it's, it's, it's a nice kind of entree into the community, if you will. Um, the, uh, I think our Fairfield Arts and Convention Center has hosted also different business types of networking events along with FIDA. I know the local area of CoLab is a very popular element of many um, communities that have their university communities to have. Uh, the CoLab in, in Fairfield is just the name of kind of a, a place where you can go and rent a space, an office space, for a very nominal amount of money, and then you can share the infrastructure of. You would probably bring your own computer, but you could share, um, you know, scanning and you know anything, any any access to printing, you know, that kind of thing that you would want to access. Um, you know, the internet is there, so that that's I, I think a, a very valuable thing for young businesses to consider as a way to save money initially, particularly if they don't need some kind of a larger production facility. They may just do their business over the computer, and so that that's uh, I think a great advantage. I know there's a great Center like that that's opened up in Cedar Falls, and we have one here, and I'm sure that there are many of the communities around Iowa. So I, I'd highly recommend that. Um, I think I think those are the main things. You know, the, the, those are called business incubators, basically. Sometimes.
Well, if you're young and you're starting a business, most likely and hopefully you've taken some business courses in college. Or you've gone to a community college. They often have really good courses at community colleges for probably less cost. Not everyone is designed to go to college uh, for the next number of years. Uh, particularly people that start businesses young tend to sometimes not like to, to go to college. They want to just get started on some idea that they have that's brilliant, but they need to be prepared. And so the educational component is very important, and I just can't stress that really enough. You know, particularly for, I think, as you expand your business and grow, another thing that I recommend um, is uh, small business consulting. Like, there's many small business management firms within uh, communities. Um, you don't find them so often in small rural communities, but they can be a tremendous asset at your different stages of growth and developing your company. And, um, you know, hopefully you've written a really clear and good and strong business plan. And you need to keep kind of tweaking that business plan. And um, I couldn't stress QuickBooks, your financial planning, and managing uh, your finances through um, something like QuickBooks. Because you can quickly run reports. You can see where you are. If you're in a downturn or an upturn, you can see how good or bad is that. And evaluate that and decide, based on that, what do I need to do? I think diversity in your business model is also very critical. Uh, we seem to have, in a very small community here, a lot of restaurants. Probably more restaurants per capita than you would ever find in a lot of small communities. In fact, I know. But, you know, people here love to go out and eat, and I think it is a feature of small rural communities, but particularly definitely in our community. And the ones that have made it long term have a bit more of a diversity in their model. And I think this also applies not just to restaurants, but to any business model. The more diverse you can in the number of different types of components of your business, um, then you can monitor where, where is most of the income being generated from. Do I drop this one and do I put more attention on this one to further it? Um, to me, those are all critical things. I think diversity in any business, large or small, um, is extremely key. Okay. One of the other things that um, I would just like to share kind of in terms of business is that our nonprofit, as part of our educational component, uh, I'm currently training in uh, small business food finance. And our, our long term goal is to create something of an institute here that would serve uh, people in the area of small food business. And it, it could be a farmer that has a value added product. It could be a young person who's just developed, um, you know, a tofu company, a whatever that company might be. There's a, a young man from that grew up here that started uh, a, a very successful tofu company up in Iowa City and has just, you know, an incredible customer base very quickly. And it's a because it's locally produced. It's uh, a, a kind of a niche product. It's organic, and. Um, you know, it's something that he can market through grocery stores, he can market to institutions. So he's got, and he's selling it actually all over the state. You know, he lives in Iowa City, but he's selling this product because it's the only company like that in the whole state. He may be even going over state borders, but, you know, it's, it's wonderful because tofu is, is extremely common, but it's, it's a good example of when people value, and this is the point of diversity in business, in my opinion, is that you can have different products in terms of diversity, or you might just have one product, but it's the way you market that product that can make it successful or not successful, particularly if you're competing with a common product. What is it about your company that stands out? Is there something wrong with your logo? You know, is there something about the way you're marketing? Is there something you do that's very value added in your business, but you're not letting the rest of the world know about it? And it, it might be something that you use solar panels in your business. You know, that you, you're not, you're, you're basically off the grid in that regard. Um, that you're, you know, some, some, because the young people grow up now are very much caring about the environment. This is the way they've been educated. And so this is becoming a strong feature, sustainability uh, in, in, in business. And it's, it's something that's um, maybe not as easy for small businesses, but if they 
have that kind of integrity and um, they can get the financing to do that in the long term they're going to save money yeah so I think this um, this local food Institute will really help look at analyze the models to see and, and this could be someone who's starting out or it could be someone who's fully engaged in their business over a number of years but they're struggling and they've been struggling too long so they finally come to us then we're able to identify that it might just be one thing that they had never thought of that they could make a slight change with and they could be back on, on track so and it may be they just don't have the right product for the marketplace at, at this time but you know we can help them identify these things and hopefully not at a huge cost to them because it is for hopefully for small sort of businesses hello I am Shannon Coleman, Assistant Professor and State Extension Specialist in Food Safety and Consumer Production in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. Searching the Iowa State website for information on small food manufacturers can lead to several choices appearing. In today's talk, I will break down the many tools found at ISU in the ISU toolbox for small food manufacturers. The Webster Dictionary defines a toolbox as a chest of tools. In order to build a solid foundation, you need a toolbox with essential tools. Examples of some of those essential tools found in that toolbox could be a hammer, a screwdriver, or a measuring tape, even pliers. ISU have the essential tools that aligns with the ISU mission to create, share, and apply the knowledge to make Iowa and the world a better place. These tools can be used to make your product and take it to the next level. They are characterized at, into three subgroups, the people, the centers, and the resources. There are several personnel from faculty members to field specialists who specialize in resources that are needed for small food manufacturers in various um, areas of topics such as food safety, food service, consumer food safety, produce food safety, local foods, product development, food quality, food safety modernization act, and business planning and development. They are familiar with the various related areas that are affiliated with small food manufacturers such as the federal and local laws and regulations, recipe and ingredients formulation, product testing to meet standards, marketing, food safety practices, packaging, sensory evaluation, and business planning. Many of the faculty and staff with these specialties are affiliated with the following organizations and centers that can provide resources and technical assistance for your business. In the next few minutes, I will, I will outline some of those centers and organizations. ISU Extension and Outreach have several education areas that work with small food, food manufacturers. The Local Foods Team mission is to help Iowans make informed decisions by applying relevant, need-driven resources to create significant impact in our state. Community and Economic Development Education Area partner to address client-identified needs and opportunities. They currently have projects addressing community food system issues they also have a retail specialist that focus on immigrant entrepreneurs. Some of the Midwest Grape and Wine Institute goals is to, in, is to conduct, conduct enology, the science of wine and wine making research, and establish outreach programs to industry by training a team of specialists. Value-added agriculture education area mission is to provide unbiased, science-based information to help establish or expand agriculture-related or rural business in Iowa. The Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition and the Department of Apparel's Event and Hospitality Management has faculty, has extension faculty members that specialize in food safety associated with the areas of food safety, consumer food safety, 
Produce Safety, and the new Food Safety Modernization Act. There, there are several other centers, non-extension related, that provide assistance to food manufacturers in this state, such as the Iowa Small Business Development Center mission is to support collaborative economic development of Iowa's by providing entrepreneur and business with individual consultation and education resources necessary to assist businesses to succeed. There are regional directors located throughout the state available to work with you in your business planning and development. The Center of Industrial Research and Service, or CIRIS, is the state of Iowa's manufacturing education program, which enhanced the performance of industry through applied research, education, and technical assistance. Many faculty in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition partner with CIRIS to perform shelf life, shelf life analysis and product testing. There are also federal funds av available to assist with the research-based program projects. The Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition has one of the best known secrets of campus, which is the Center of Crop Utilization Research, which mission is to identify, coordinate, and fa facilitate and foster mission-oriented interdisciplinary research, both basic and applied. Develop technology, transfer, and commercialize activities that will increase and enhance the utilization of Midwest crop and create new agriculture entrepreneurship in Iowa. The center has a pilot plant and test kitchen space available for fee-for-service for small food manufacturers to use at, if they want to scale up their product before purchasing expensive equipment. Finally, we have our resources. All of the centers mentioned before have websites loaded with information for small food manufacturers. Through Iowa State Extension and Outreach website, you will have access to the Extension Store, which houses several fact sheets and flow charts related to several food products. There are a series of trainings available with industry and government approved food safety programs in the area of Food Safety Modernization Act, as well as SurfSafe for restaurants. As mentioned before, there is fee-for-service options available for product testing through the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. Typical testing methods performed are shelf life analysis, challenge studies, pH analysis, water activity, color analysis, just to name a few. To recap this information gathered, ISU has tools available that can take your product to the next level. They are all categorized into three subgroups, the people, the center, and the resources. All of these tools align with the university mission, which is to create, share, and apply knowledge to make Iowa and the world a better place. For more information, please visit our website at iastate.edu. Thank you. Sure, I'm Brian Tapp. I'm the Regional Director of the Iowa State University Small Business Development Center here in Ames, Iowa. So typically, most of the folks that have done a farmer's market or pro food preparation or food production for those, for those events have some knowledge base about what they're producing and um, getting some validation, whether it be from friends or family or even the farmer's market for the quality of their product. One of the things that we look at when we're working with those clients is if we're looking at how we can grow that product line, we're looking at the focus of what, what other background or what other elements do we need to do in those markets, right? How do we, how do we focus them on scaling and education of components? So some of that might, might be we work with a business model canvas, we're some early startups that really have not looked at the numbers yet or looked at the market segments or even um, social media, different things like that. So we'll focus with them on that. If, if we feel that they've, they're past that point, then what we'll do is really look at the business plan components. It may not be a full-fledged business plan initially. It may be more of a condensed version where we're tr trying to identify w how can they grow, how can they grow their SKUs, and we can talk a little bit more about that as well, than from one SKU to three SKUs to 10 SKUs, right? And what, the, what that can be for their uh, market segment on the food product that they're producing. Um, 
if we go through that business plan, one of the things I'd, I'd like to talk about is that value chain as well with those clients about who's taking what and how are they going to scale up and what does that look like for them as far as who's taking a cut out of whatever jar of salsa they're making or any other food preparation because I think sometimes going from that farmer's market to the store shelf to multiple stores is kind of a surprising um, element and a uh, uh, recognition that other people are taking a cut out of what you're trying to produce, right? And, and looking at that. So those education components, really trying to enlighten them um, through the SPDC statewide network. We really uh, sit down and work on those, those elements and really try to bring those forth for the client. Sure, so one of the things that, uh, that we also discuss and I work with clients on on a weekly basis is a continuum of funding. And what, what we mean by that is when you're doing a startup, you may have some friends or family or somebody else, we kind of joke about that, that may do an initial investment with you. But as we work our way up, we may look to more like a seed capital, uh, micro loan program that may be up to $25,000. And then we, we look and see with the structure. So the more advanced that we get on that continuum, the more solid that business model has to be. So um, for us to say like, well, I sold, um, uh, again, I'll use salsa. I'll use a, I sold 100 uh, jars of salsa at the farmer's market, um, but I'm trying to sell 10,000 jars, right? There's going to have to be more uh, validity and more definition with that model to get more of those funding, funding sources. So there are a lot of funding elements out there. I always tell clients, and my history's been, and being around finance and um, micro -lend lending for 20 some years, is that the money's the easy part. It's really that niche market for that food product and really finding out how you can scale and grow to where you want to be. Is it, you know, and, some, and we have to have a self-realization too for some of the clients that is it a hobby or is it really you want to make a business out of it? And so we're looking at really scaling up for a business and there's so much potential with a lot of the clients that I work with is that how risk tolerant are they to really scale that up to a half a million dollars? But there's, like I said, there's a lot of resources out there to really help those folks um, financially get up and going. And um, a lot of, there's a lot of good resources that connect with um, whoever, whoever it might be. Yes, yeah, so there's multiples with that. What I typically work with clients on on the Sm Small Business Development Center side is I'm working with them on really getting everything structured with the state and federal government to make sure it's sales tax and all of that. If I do have a client come in, I always try to refer them either over to ISU Extension through some of their food, uh, their food programs, um, also through value-added agriculture, through, through those folks. There's a lot of training going on, a lot of transition. So any, any technical assistance that they can get for kitchen size, for production, for um, uh, a flow for production, uh, for that for that kitchen or uh, meat producer, whatever it might be, I try to make sure that those folks are talking in the right pl place. Even the meat lab over at um, at ISU is another great uh, resource. And then also we work pretty closely with Cirrus, who will really, if you're if you're looking to grow from, you're making sausages and you're looking to grow to really put that flow better. You know they can assist you as well with that with that level of uh, expertise. So really trying to be more cohesive. Um, Real, but my, my real goal is to, on that first side is really the state and federal regulations with just just the tax side and structure. So, but there, there's a lot of good support and a lot of good people willing to help them. So going alone and saying, hey, I don't know um, how I should do this, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Um, right, uh, probably, probably see better information that you get, the better decisions you're gonna make with that and better chance for success. So I think that when I work with a lot of these clients, I don't think that sometimes in a small start, they're not looking at, I want a $5 million business, right? They're thinking, I like to do this, I'm comfortable doing it, and that's fine you know, with what they want to do. But if they do have anywhere in the back of their mind that they want to scale, the sooner they can get around more people for like, whether it's an entrepreneurship training program, it doesn't matter who it's through, but just try to get around more people that are maybe like-minded um, try to attend a lot of events that may be out there to help you scale up, um, give you some different ideas, give you some market niches, and um, I think that would be really beneficial. 
and and there's it's okay to it's okay to be smaller but if you would like to scale there's a lot of good opportunity to make that work i also would say that i mentioned earlier on the SKUs, um, sending one bottle of um, barbecue sauce on the shelf in a massive uh, um, a grocery aisle probably isn't going to be just it you need to have at least three spots on that shelf to really promote your brand and that brand identity um, with again it could be barbecue sauce whatever else you're making just to make sure that you've got brand identity and that you're holding the integrity of that brand uh, long term for you so I'd say that the last thing I, I always uh, work with clients on is we really need to talk they really need to focus on who's doing their financial work for them right are they doing it? Are, is it one of those things that it's on the side and I'm letting somebody else do it like every six months? If you're gonna scale up and you're gonna be successful, you need somebody. If you don't like to do it, that's fine, but find somebody that can help you with that. And I, if I did a percentage of clients that I work with on that, probably 90% don't wanna touch the financial side, and that's okay, find somebody who does. And that will really help you scale up. You'll know your cost of goods, you'll know your, your, uh, your value chain of who's taking a cut, and, and you'll also um, really help you succeed. And you can see, you know, you can get paid, right? And that's the ultimate goal is to make money and um, with, with the food product.